Hi. What I have here on the workbench today is a Nano VNA-FV3 Vector Network Analyzer by SysJoint. It supports a frequency range between 1 MHz and 6.3 GHz. If you have been following my channel, you will probably remember that I did a review on the V2 version of the Nano VNA-F at the beginning of last year, and I was very satisfied with its build quality and performance. So when I saw the V3 version on Banggood's website, I immediately contacted them and requested one for review. And thanks Banggood for providing me with this unit. As usual, I will leave a product link in the video description below for those who are interested in getting one after watching this video. Very briefly, most of my viewers probably are already familiar with spectral analyzers, which can perform frequency and amplitude measurements. A network analyzer, on the other hand, can do amplitude and phase measurements, and it can characterize both transmitted and reflected signals. Anyway, here I have the V2 and V3 versions side by side. As you can see here, besides the version numbers that are different, everything else look pretty much identical. Well, I suppose the LCDs are slightly different. The one on the V2 has this matte finish, whereas the one on the V3 has glossy finish. Now, I do prefer the matte finish, as you can see the reflection on the screen here. And let me turn these over. You'll see the reverse side. You can see that the reverse side of these two units are also identical. There is a diagram explaining what each of the S parameters means in a two-port network, which is a nice touch. As you can see from the diagram, when there is a mismatch in impedance, you have the reflected power, which is measured by S11, and you have the transmitted power, which is measured by S21. Since this nano VNA only has two ports, if you need to measure S22 or S12, you will need to flip the device under test around. But you can measure all four of these S parameters with this nano VNA. Of course, the packaging between the versions change a little bit. Instead of the plastic case for the V2, the V3 now comes with this much larger box. But inside, the accessories are largely identical. You get two of these relatively high quality, rigid RG405 cables, the typical open, short, and load calibration kit, and three of these SMA adapters. And just as a refresher, the Nano VNA V2 has a specified frequency range between 50 kHz and 3 GHz, whereas the Nano VNA-FV3 has a specified frequency range between 1 MHz and 6.3 GHz. Compared to the V2 on the lower frequency end, the V3 does sacrifice a little bit, as it can only measure down to 1 MHz instead of the 50 kHz on the V2. Although the V2 has a maximum frequency range of 3 GHz, according to the spec, I did a firmware upgrade a while ago, and after the upgrade, I noticed that I could go all the way up to 4.4 GHz, which coincidentally is the highest frequency of the ADF4350 BCO used inside the V2 version. Anyway, the frequency range of the V3 version goes even higher, up to 6.3 GHz. So if you need to measure beyond 4.4 GHz, you will need to get a V3 version. Now, the V3 version is about $100 more expensive than the V2 version, but the premium you pay is for the extra performance. Besides the maximum frequency range difference between these two models, I don't see any other obvious differences, at least in terms of specs. So let's power them on and explore a little bit more. Now I have powered on both units. I had to turn off the overhead lights as there is just too much glare on the screen here. Well, the first thing you will notice is that the sweep speed of the V3 version is significantly faster than that of the V2 version. Here I have them side by side, both doing a full bandwidth sweep with the default 101 points. And you can see that the V3 version is faster, although it has higher bandwidth. So we'll definitely have to see in the teardown later what hardware changes they have made in the V3. Another thing worth mentioning is that with the V3, you can specify the number of points used per scan. And you can set it all the way up to 801 points. So let me show you here. And here we can set it to, in fact, if you just set a random number here, as long as it's above the maximum, it will automatically change to the maximum it supports. So here is 801. And if you notice on the V2, we actually don't have that many options. So if I come back here, let's go to display. 
And you notice that we don't have that uh, option here to select different sweep points. Of course, the sweep speed slows down significantly as the number of points increase. But you can see, it is actually not that much slower compared to the original V2 version with just over 100 points. So the speed improvements of the V3 version is huge. And by the way, before I forget, here I have a light VNA for comparison. The light VNA also goes up to 6.3 GHz as you can see here. And on the lower frequency side, it extends down to 1.6 kHz. Although in reality, the lower limit is probably higher than that. As you can see, the spike here on the S21. According to the manual, the useful range starts at about 50 kHz. Let me change the number of points back to 101 on the V3 here. So we can have a fair comparison between these two. Oh, and one thing I forgot to show you is that after a calibration, you can see the S21 trace on the Nano VNA-FV3 is much flatter compared to that on the Light VNA. We know that harmonic mixing is used in the Light VNA to enable the higher frequency range. So it makes sense for the elevated noise floor above 3.3 GHz here. For comparison, the S21 remains pretty flat on the Nano VNA-FV3, and it only started inching up towards the very end at around 5.8 GHz. So just by this observation, the performance of the Nano VNA-FV3 should be much better compared to that of the Light VNA at frequencies above 3 GHz. All right, let's do some measurements. First, let's test out a few antennas. I have tested the same antennas when I reviewed the other nano VNAs before. The first antenna I'm going to test is this single band antenna with a working frequency centered around 840 MHz or thereabout. So let's calibrate a frequency range between 500 MHz and 1.5 GHz. Start 500 MHz and stop. 1.5 gigahertz. And because we're only measuring S11, we can turn off all the other traces. So go to display, trace, trace 1, and trace 2. Both are gone. And by the way, whenever you change to a new frequency range, you should always do a calibration, unless you had previously saved that calibration for that specific range. So let's calibrate. And first one is open. And you can see the calibration actually runs very fast compared to some other nano VNAs that I have tested before. Now the second one is short. And we're going to put on load. And because we're only doing S11 measurement, we don't have to do the through calibration. So we're done here. I'm going to save it. Now let me put on the antenna. And we can see a dip here. So let's take a look at the frequency. And that's it, right around 840 megahertz. Probably the center frequency would be 850 megahertz. Right now we're showing the return loss in log mag. And I could have just adjusted the verticals to stretch this curve down a little bit more. But uh, what I want to show you actually is the SWR measurement as that is probably more familiar to ham radio operators. So let's come back here. Let's see. We change display, format, and SWR. So now you can actually see the characteristics of the antenna. And typically we wanted SWR to be under 1.5. So you can see here, the range for that is between roughly 820 and uh, 900 megahertz. The next antenna I wanted to take a look is this multiband antenna. 
From previous tests, we know that it has two resonant frequencies, one at 840 MHz and the other at 1.77 GHz. Now let's do a scan of the entire 6.3 GHz band and see what else we get from this antenna. As you can see here, there is an additional resonant frequency that I didn't notice before as the nano VNAs I used to test this antenna before didn't have a frequency range that high. So let's take a look at what that frequency is. So do the marker, search, minimum. And you can see that is right around 5.9 gigahertz. And let's just verify the previous minimums here. So this one is roughly at 1.89 and uh, the other one is at 820 megahertz. And these are just rough numbers because the band is actually very wide here. And now let's take a look at the SWR. Display and format, SWR. As you can see, the two operating frequency here again. On the SWR chart, it looks more prominent here. And this is the additional frequency that we mentioned earlier. And the last antenna I wanted to test is this waveform wideband MIMO antenna that operates between 600 MHz and 6 GHz. That you can see that is a big antenna back there. We tested this antenna on the channel a while ago. With the Nano VNA-FV3 goes all the way up to 6.3 GHz, we can test out this MIMO antenna. For this test, I'm measuring both the S11 and the S21, and the S21 is measured between two adjacent antennas, so we can get a rough idea of what the cross-polarization isolation is. And right now, you're looking at the scan between 1 MHz and 6.3 GHz, and uh, the antenna's range starts at 600 MHz, which is roughly where the cursor is at right now. The cyan line here, that's the S21, and that measures the isolation between the two adjacent channels. As you can see, the channel isolation actually gets a lot better as the frequency increases. So at the beginning, it is at roughly minus 20 dB, and as frequency increases, it drops to minus 30, minus 40, and at some point, it's minus 55. So this isolation is actually excellent. And now let me turn off this S21, and we'll concentrate on the S11 here. And let me enable the SWR. So you can see it a little bit better. And you can see that this antenna is really impressive. It has a pretty flat SWR for almost the entire band. Right now, our marker is just at the beginning of the frequency response at roughly 630 megahertz. So you can see here, the SWR is measured at 2.4 roughly. And if you look at spec, actually that's within spec because at the lower frequency band, we have a SWR of less or equal to 2.5. And by the way, if you look at the spec, you will see that we do have a break at between 1 gigahertz and 1.7 gigahertz. And that's actually where you see this spike coming in. So this is not within the operational frequency band here. So let me just move the cursor. So this spike occurs at around 1.3 gigahertz. And for the remaining of the spectrum, up to 6.3 gigahertz, you can see that the SWR is really low. And for our next test, let's take a look at an RC filter that I have here. For that, I have calibrated the range between 300 and 500 megahertz. And you can see that I did enable 801 points, so we can see a little bit more details here. And here you can see a very sharp response in the S21. So let's take a look at what that frequency is. So you can see that's right around 339 megahertz. And that's the operating frequency of the filter. For the last test, I want to do a TDR measurement. Let's just recall the first setting here. And let's change it to TDR. Turn on the TDR. 
time domain reflectometry functionality can be used to measure the cable length. And here I have a RG405 cable that is roughly 30 centimeters. Let's just verify that. And you can see that's uh, roughly 30 centimeters. So let's uh, hook it up and see what we get here. And by the way, the velocity factor of the RG405 is roughly at 0.7. So actually, let's uh, take a look here. Yeah, so the velocity factor is already set to 0.7. Of course, it depends on the cable. You can set it differently. But for RG405, it is roughly at 0.7. So let's find the peak. And you can see we have a reading of 302.57 millimeter, which is roughly 30 centimeters. So that's the cable we connected to port 1. Now, let's briefly look at the signal generator functionality of this nano VNA-FV3. It appears though the output frequency range is identical to the V2, which tops at 4.4 GHz. For the test, I'm outputting a 1 GHz signal, as you can see here. That output is at 0 dBm. So let's take a look on the spectrum analyzer. And here is the output spectrum. I have the center frequency set at 1 GHz with a frequency span of 100 MHz. And let's do a peak search. You can see that we're sitting at roughly 1 GHz. Now, the signal doesn't look as clean as I remembered from the nano VNA-FV2, uh, which we'll take a look a little bit later. You can see we have this skirt at a pretty high level here, and also we have two side tones that are about 50 dB down. So this behavior is definitely very specific to the synthesizer used. And for comparison, I'm currently outputting a 1 GHz signal at 0 dBm from the Nano VNA-FV2. As you can see here, the spectrum is a lot cleaner. And here I have connected to the Nano VNA-FV3 again, but this time I'm outputting a 4.4 GHz signal. That is the maximum signal you can output. And you can see that the signal quality definitely deteriorated quite a bit. And we have a lot of these side tones, and also the bass noise is noticeably higher than before. And here is the same 4.4 GHz signal output from the Nano VNA-FV2. And you can see that signal quality is actually significantly better than that from the V3. So this is definitely something to keep in mind if you intend to use the Nano VNA-FV3 as your RF signal generator. And here is on the LCD side, you can see we really don't have a whole lot going on besides the LCD. Here is our touch screen. You can see we have this four resistive touch screen overlay on top of the LCD. Now the LCD itself is quite glossy. And towards the right side here, you can see we have this programming port. And by the look of it, we also have some test points for clock and battery. All right. The internal construction is almost exactly the same in this V3 compared to the V2. The battery board is stacked on top of the main board and I had to just remove it. And also I removed the shooting cans as well. These shooting cans are clipped on, so it's very nice that I can just pry them off without having to desolder anything. And I'm just looking at the battery here. The battery capacity in this V3 is rated at 15.3 watt hours and it seems to be a little bit less than that in the V2. If I recall correctly, the battery in the V2 version is rated for 19 watt hours. So perhaps the overall current draw of the V3 is less. And let me swap in a macro lens so we can see the circuit board a little bit better. Although the overall layout of the circuit board is largely the same as the V2, there are a few crucial differences. For instance, towards the S1 port, you can see this chip right here. That's an ADL5801, which is a 10 MHz to 6 GHz active mixer from analog devices. This chip is actually quite expensive. On DigiKey, it is at around $11 a pop for a quantity of 100. And between the S11 and S21 ports, we also have these MS5351 clock generator as the same in the V2 version, but now we have two of these. Another main difference between the V3 and V2 version is the synthesizer used here. In V2, the synthesizer used is an analog device ADF4350, which goes up to 4.4 GHz. 
Whereas in the V3, you can see we have this chip right here. That's a maximum 2870E, which is a 23.5 megahertz to 6 gigahertz fractional integer and synthesizer and VCO. And this chip is not cheap either. It costs around $10 a piece. And in this nano VNA-F V3, we have two of them. The other one is located at the bottom here. The microcontroller used in the V3 is also different. Here we have an Artery AT30F403, which has an ARM Cortex-M4 core. Compared to the GD32F103 used in the F2 version, this is a significant improvement. The maximum clock speed is doubled for the AT32F403, which explains the significant improvement in performance we saw earlier. And for everything else, it looks like the design and components used are pretty much the same here. Here we have the same XPT2046 touchscreen controller, and we also have the same, by the look of it, IP5306 charging chip. And that pretty much wraps up this review. So the V3 is definitely not just some minor software tweaks, but as you have seen in the teardown, there are a lot of fundamental redesigns using better spec and more capable components. The overall build quality is excellent. And the Nano VNA-F V3 is definitely something you should consider if you are upgrading from your V2. I hope you enjoyed this review and teardown. If you liked the video, please remember to give it a big thumbs up and remember to subscribe to the channel as well. Your support makes it possible for me to continue producing content like this. Thank you, and I will catch up with you next time.